Facebook and things like this. Right. And okay. we will do another things. And I was thinking to do um, activities online. And you must maybe you absolutely with must. This you know. is going to be this the way that we can remain with the public. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Bye bye. No, stay there. <laughs> Don't go no, away. Stay, stay, no, stay. It's just because I pressed the button live, so we're now live, and I didn't even do the introduction because what I thought that you were saying was so interesting. So I decided to, you know, when there's a, we go to a concert and we enter, but the, there's music, the instruments are rehearsing, and uh, so that's what's happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. Hi, Silke Ackerman. Hi, Kirsten. Hello, Marta. Hi, Hi. Titas. Everyone is here. More people will come. I know it's Friday afternoon. Uh, well, not for Anna, not for Deborah, but uh, anyway, it's Friday. Okay, it's Friday. That's a it's common Friday. thing <laughs> for everyone. And so I would suggest that we just start and we keep the conversation among ourselves. And then if people join, they join. If they don't join or whatever later, I will let them in. Good afternoon, you know, and uh, good morning. No, I don't know. I think so. Uh, to uh, whoever is following us anywhere in the world, also on Zoom. We started these Friday webinars, two per Friday, one month ago. And the aim was to share our experiences as university museum professionals as we navigated through the COVID lockdowns, closures, reopenings, and possibly even reclosures. In total, we have had more than 300 university museum professionals attending the webinars from all over the world. And for the past five weeks, we have become used to see each other's faces and hear each other's voices. And in fact, we created a special community. And that was UMAC's real aim of these webinars all along to be here for one another and to support each other in these difficult, uh, challenging times. Today we meet for the last time, at least in this um, so-called UMAC lockdown series. Our theme is the near future and we would like to focus on the effects of COVID in our institutions, our practices, our audiences and ourselves. Some of the questions we would like to address are, what is the immediate and midterm impact of COVID in your university museum, in your university collection? What consequences do you anticipate in terms of audiences, logistics, finances, access, even perhaps mission, strategy? The webinar will be moderated by our dear friend, Steph Scholten, Vice Chair of UMAC, and director of the Hunterian at the University of Glasgow, which I thought was going to open tomorrow, but not yet. So thank you so much, Steph. And over to you and to our participants. At the moment, not that many, but I hope that the attendance will grow. Thank you, Steph. Okay. Thank you, Marta. Um, I mean, you've, you've been present in all the webinars, I think, morning and afternoons over the last um, four I weeks I or uh, five weeks. I love so, it. So you've, you've done, this is your 10th. Um, it's my, I, I've been in all the morning ones normally, but now I'm, uh, um, I was asked to, uh, to, to moderate this afternoon one, which is, um, which is very nice to do. So welcome to everybody. And um, I'm glad to see more people are, um, uh, joining. So in the morning sessions, we had obviously we had a lot of people from the other side of the world. So from Asia, Australia, and uh, this is an opportunity for the Americas um, um, uh, specifically, but I also see colleagues from the UK and Germany. Um, um, Titas, um, um, apologies, but w w could you, um, we can maybe do a very quick round of introductions. Um, could you, um, could you start, uh, please, Titas? Titas. Okay. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. I'm from uh, Lisboa, Lisbon, from Faraday Museum. My name is Carlos Fernandes. Right. And uh, uh, I, ha uh, I hope to be here as uh, only to listen <laughs> because I thought there was 
uh, much more persons uh, uh, in, uh, in the session. But anyway, uh, uh, I was present in last week in four uh, webinar, and uh, I attend the first one. All the others I missed because I, I'm a teacher in the university and I have at the same time a lot of work uh, uh, concerning teaching. But the idea that uh, uh, I, uh, I have from all the discussions of this webinars was that the in the near future, after lockdown, mm. uh, online teaching was assumed as an inevitability. And uh, what uh, I ask is, what is the sense of having teaching practices mostly or predominantly online? So uh, what is this sense? Because what I think is there are consequences of that. So there is um, a decrease in, uh, a decrease of interpersonal activities uh, in the physical space. And this includes museums. So it depends on the, the kind of museums, scientific uh, museums, teaching, or as a, a museum like Faraday Museum. So in the case of museums where uh, experiment, experimenting and uh, the use of objects at display is crucial, I fear that to move online teaching may prove fatal. <laughs> so this is uh, mm -hmm. something to, to discuss. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a good point. It's a very good point. So, and, and there is another thing, an increase, also an increase uh, of uh, uh, letters, uh, 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 social inequality, for instance. Uh, uh, only those with access to, to social conditions to access online online teaching uh, may be uh, favored by uh, this. We must pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Steph, another thing. So I put all the questions there, so mixed. Uh, and this is something that uh, is physical, in the sense of physical. So uh, if you have um, a, a cause, this mm -hmm. cause makes um, an effect mm -hmm. and this effect may reinforce or um, may uh, decrease the cause. This is what we call in physical positive or negative yes. feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think that online teaching that, that, is, uh, that has a lot of advantages induce at the end something that uh, reinforces the the impersonal activities. So uh, I think that blended, mixed is the, the answer always, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's, I'm sure we'll be talking about that. So thank you that, uh, for that, um, for those questions, I think that we need to be uh, um, talking about. Some of them have come up in um, earlier sessions or um, I think the, the, the online is for everybody is, you know. It's, it's a new normal, um, uh, apparently. Um, and we all have to get used to that. And, Mar and Marta now reminds me she's to um, introduce myself, um, even though she did that already. So I'm Steph Scholt and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the director of the Hunterian uh, Museum of the University of Glasgow. And I'm, uh, I'm Dutch. I'm, I'm currently actually in Amsterdam, so I, um, 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 which is interesting because you can see COVID, um, two different stages of COVID, um, where in the UK is very much still in lockdown. It's slowly but surely um, released. Um, I think museums in the UK, in England, are allowed to reopen um, from tomorrow officially, but from the list that I saw today from the Museum Association, there's... Um, there's not really a lot of museums that will already open up, uh, except for the National Gallery in London, I think. 
um, so it's slow going. Um, but Scotland is uh, slower than England, and but Holland is already, uh, the Netherlands is already quite um, uh, ahead of things, uh, where museums have been open since the first of June. Um, so um, it, it's good to be in a place I can assure you where things already start to feel a bit normal, a bit more normal, again. But I realize, of course, we're you know in in a chat with. Um, um, with colleagues from Brazil, from Mexico. Um, um, I don't know, Gilbert and Lisette, where you are from, um, but the, um, um, we're, um, um, it, it, you're still very much in the middle, uh, Lisette also from Mexico, um, um, and Gilbert uh, Beirut. Okay, that's interesting. Could you, could you maybe briefly tell us, because I've not heard from the Middle East at all, um, how um, how things are there. So, hi, I'm uh, from Lebanon, so from Beirut. And uh, actually here in Beirut, all the universities are still closed and uh, the museums are linked to, uh, directly to the university. So we, they cannot open to the public, even uh, if they want to. It's a closed institution. And even in the normal days, not all the university museums are open to the public. So students are still at home and uh, we don't know yet if we will get back in September or no. Um, I can say that all uh, the other public uh, museums uh, begins to open uh, for a um, restrict with restrictions. So uh, uh, to keep the social distancing and uh, all the measures for the uh, COVID-19 virus. And we still have some cases every day. Um, so that's what I can say for now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The, the um, um, particularly, I mean, it seems maybe Deborah, you can say something. Um, the situation in Brazil seems very worrying to, uh, to, you know, people on the other side of the world. How is that for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm Deborah. I'm from Pernambuco. Uh, it's the northeast region of Brazil. So I saw some colleagues from Sao Paulo in like webinar, but I think that I am the first from Northeast part, I'm not sure. But here we we are closed, the, the university is closed. But, um, and I think all the museums are still closed too. But we are trying to, um, to get a, 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 how can I say, to try to, to to open, to reopen, but it's a little bit difficult because we have many information from the university, from the uh, government, and sometimes they are a little bit uh, different, convergent, yes. <laughs> so there are a lot of disagreements about reopen on how we can reopen, but uh, we are at the university, at USDA. We are now having a questionnaire. So all the students and professors are uh, answering this questionnaire. So I think that in, at the end of July, we may have an uh, answer about if we are going to open, to reopen. Uh, for research, only for research mm -hmm. now, like labs, and but it's not uh, a real answer for, for now. It's, they are planning, they are thinking about, but we are, we are trying to develop some uh, patterns, you know, some. Mm -hmm. uh, Roadmap, to, yeah, protocol, yes. a protocol to yeah. to follow, like right. trying to be safe and yeah. keep everybody safe. But yeah. until now, our museum is closed, also, and we are we are planning to reopen. I think maybe next year, but we are trying to to figure out how can we make more virtual, more uh, digital as possible. Yes. For for to to keep it 
working to keep it sharing knowledge and all these things. But for now, we are working in home office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting to see that we, we all seem to, we, we all are, I think, in the same, um, you know, in the same place. Most, um, I mean, things are closed, universities are closed, museums are closed, and only very slowly um, um, things are now starting to reopen in some places in the world. But this is going to be around for quite a, quite a bit longer, I think, um, and especially in you know, I think in, in countries where 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 um, problems are quite big. I see John joined us from um, the U.S. from Washington. Hi, John. How are you? How how are things? Um, how are things out there? You uh, you have to um, unmute yourself, John. Yes. Uh, we're, we're quiet out here. It's a national holiday. So the administration wants everyone to go in the mall and spread the virus. But other than that, most people aren't going right. to go and go inside and behave. So, so it's, it's, it's fairly quiet. We're, uh, the university is going to open in September, August and September. They'll, they'll invite students back. Uh, we will definitely not do programming on site. So programs are off because we simply don't want the public to come in and, and risk the virus. Uh, but we are trying to make it all virtually uh, compatible so that when we do a program, it be virtual. We will do on-site programs for students and faculty in very small groups, learning opportunities. And we don't know if we'll let the public in the galleries or not. We just don't know yet. Yeah. We're we're considering whether we, we will allow the students and faculty in to see the galleries at certain times, but we just don't know mm -hmm. the general public because the university doesn't know whether it wants to be liable for bringing in people who aren't students, faculty, and part of the community into the, into the, uh, into the museum. So we're preparing for either way. We don't make money on visitors anyway. It's simply public service. So if uh, and, and I'm I'm of mixed minds on on whether that service is worth the risk. Uh, uh, and the and and as you probably know in the news, the pandemic's getting worse here, not better. So, exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. Basically, due to some very foolish policies of not wearing masks and the like. But uh, uh, better in D.C. But nevertheless, the risk is very high. And the average museum visitor who's not a student or faculty person tends to be older tends to be more uh, vulnerable. So, so personally, I'm, I'm very concerned about it and don't want to be open too soon, to the general public at least. The, I, I, th I think that is the, um, the, the big question. You know, it, can we do it? When can we do it? Can we do it safely? And I think, you know, um, it, it's interesting to look at the, um, I think at the ex examples where museums have reopened, for instance, so in some European countries, I'm thinking, I see Kirsten uh, from Dresden in Germany. Um, and she's, she's, I mean, for me, she's a bit the light at the end of the tunnel because next year we'll all be in Dresden, Germany for the joint Universal UMAC conference. Fingers crossed. Um, that's a good thing to, uh, to look forward to. How are things for you, uh, Kirsten, uh, at this point? Well, Maybe, maybe you know, um, things have not been uh, so bad in Germany. However, of course, um, everything was closed as well. Um, the museums, like the city museums and everything, they're open now for about a month now. Of course, the regulations for everything that concerns visitors, that's uh, same for us at the university, our exhibition spaces, um, we can open them, but we have to sort of, you know, hand in sort of an health and hygiene concept to make it possible. Yeah. Um, so we have to, you know, ask for allowance, but we can do that. Um, of course, it has been very difficult for us as well, because we had to sort of switch over very quickly in about a month, we had to switch into, you know, online mode. And, and that was really overwhelming for a lot of um, teachers, especially. And they all said it was a lot of work and way more work than Poor, so um, that was difficult. Um, as for the rest, um, we talked to uh, Marta and Sebastian and everything about it. I mean, we have to really sort of go as it, you know, we have to just go along as um, 
as it develops further. Um, of course, we're planning the um, conference and we're in the middle of it pretty much. And mm -hmm. uh, we're presenting it to you at the UMEC. And um, I'm really hoping it's gonna happen because especially right now, I think it's really important to you know, have a, you know, an actual space to really meet physically again. And hopefully by the time, who knows, we, I mean, we can't really say, but maybe it's better um, until then, uh, we don't know, but uh, we definitely would like to make it happen for everybody. And of course, everybody is more than welcome to come to Dresden and we mm -hmm. would be more than happy to have you but we don't know at this point. However, if this is all not gonna work out, we will try to find some kind of digital mode to actually make you know, the conference happening in some other way. So we'll see. Well, we, we, we're gonna practice with that because the UMEC conference that was planned for September in Sydney is obviously not happening either. So we are going to be planning some online events in some shape or form. I think we're still learning and thinking about how, what that could look like. I think all the major conferences have been canceled anywhere in the world. Um, yeah. Last week it was also announced, or this week, that the, the big museum conference in the UK that happens every year has been canceled. Um, um, but also they will, they will go online and um, it will be interesting to see if we can get used to a online conference without all the socializing without uh, or, or we need to find alternatives for it i don't know i don't know if it's possible but um, i definitely look forward to coming to dresden uh, uh, next year september right um yeah it will be from um end of august um until september 5th yeah okay okay and yesterday i i'm going to confess we had a meeting yesterday, uh, me and Sebastien, who is the chair of Universeum, because it's going to be a joint meeting with Mac Universeum. And we had a wonderful meeting with uh, Kirsten and Jörg. They were in Dresden. And the program that we are preparing is super, super exciting. Super mm -hmm. exciting. It's going to be very, very good. It's going to be the first time we meet after this you know, confusion. We hope everything will be quieter then and we can have some time and space to reflect about, you know, what we're trying to discuss here now, which is the impact that all this will have on our lives and on our, you know, audiences and so on. So it's going to be really exciting. And also the the commemoration of the 20 years of UMAC, which was supposed to be happening this year in Australia, is going to happen next year in Dresden. So really, really going to be a wonderful thing. And the fabulous collections of Dresden and the fabulous collections of Dresden. Mm -hmm. Absolutely marvelous. Five stars. So I don't know, better start planning and saving, I guess, the, uh, you know, for some of us. So how is Bogota, Gustavo? Thank you for joining us. And, and, and can you tell anything about your where you are in the in the transition from open to close to open again? Well, uh, our museum, our university, uh, at this moment is the the worst time uh, of the um, COVID here in in Colombia. Because the the curve is is in the in the top, uh, probably in the end of July or on the first uh, week of uh, August, is is the the top of the curve. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, we are very surprised because our university opened some laboratories, especially for a, a little group of students. But uh, we hope near the middle of August or the uh, first uh, week of September, we can open our museum. If the situation don't go worst, uh, we hope <laughs> we hope because we have uh, a lot of problems with uh, in the hospitals, in the units of emergencies because we do have a, a, a no uh, respiratory uh, complements, mm -hmm. and it's the main problem in all America Latina. Uh, Latin America, because uh, 
all the, the this kind of stuff as uh, uh, very difficult to, to access. Uh, and uh, some universities in Colombia made a special plan to, to, to build a respiratory uh, uh, auxiliary and, and very successful. The, this, this morning, the news say that the, it's approved by the government and probably it's just a good news because it's, we, we can uh, uh, respond more, much better uh, with the situation. And we hope uh, the first or the, uh, on the end of August or the first of September, we can reopen our our museum. Cool, cool. The um, um, so one of the things, one of the questions, I think, for um, 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 for many of us. I mean, in the UK, um, university are highly dependent on income from students. So the student tuition fees are like in the America, or in the USA. Sorry. Um, 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 and so all universities are terrified whether the students will actually come. And it's interesting to see that um, um, in terms of registration, all the numbers um, from students seem to be up, which is remarkable. Um, so so um, it seems there's more students that have registered than even last year. But of course, everybody is waiting to see how many students will actually come in September when uh, the university restarts. I think in, in the UK, most, most universities are actually starting um, most courses in September. How is that in Oxford, Silke? Um, we, uh, I find it quite amusing that uh, the two people who are representing the UK here are both not uh, British. Uh, oh, well. so uh, so, um, um, so in terms of Oxford, um, the university has, as you just said, um, is, is positive about student numbers, surprisingly, and just for those who don't know the UK situation so well, you might think it's all the same for all of us, uh, but uh, Steph and I are actually in two separate nations. Uh, Steph is in Scotland, I'm in England, and the regulations are different. Um, changes are being brought in at different speeds. Um, so it's not all um, um, universally the, across the board. Uh, we are uh, watching with bated breath at the moment uh, because so many changes are coming in, so many um, changes out of the lockdown on this uh, tomorrow. Um, so we don't quite know what the situation is going to be next week, but coming back to the university, uh, students have signed up and we have um, just learned that the university will have its own test and uh, track system, um, which is of course meant to give students and staff um, uh, more assurance that uh, there will be more safety for those returning. So that is all, uh, all quite positive. And Really, um, I personally feel that um, the crisis has released enormous amounts of creative energy. Um, there's so many new ideas, no, so many new initiatives, decisions are taken quickly, collaborations are happening. Um, I think that is fantastically uh, positive. Uh, I'm also, um, I don't share the concerns about um, online. Um, again, uh, yes, of course, physical is lovely. Um, and ultimately what we would love to do, but um, online has been very, very inclusive. Um, changes we've made to conferences have meant that people were able to attend who for financial reasons are normally, or in other cases, other instances, not able to attend. And also let's face it, we all hop on planes to go to places and is that really what we should be doing for the environment? So um, there are all sort of questions out there. So I think there are great advantages there. And also, I think in, never in future will we be able to just do conferences for those who are uh, physically in the place. I think we can just expect now that there will also be Zoom um, um, availability so that we can include everybody there. Um, so I think that's actually a good point for Kirsten and Marta just to take on board, just to uh, when organizing uh, Dresden, you know, just to make sure that whatever we do there, that it may also be 
available on our YouTube Please. channel or wherever? Yeah, I think there's no way back. I agree totally yeah. with Tilka. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's no way of doing the same old things again, you know, and everything has to be broadcasted from now on because we just, you know, we started this and we, it's not that difficult and it brings more people to the conversation, to the debates and uh, it can be done. I'm, I'm a bit nervous about the general, annual general meeting, you know, because that's a different thing you have to vote. And so how do you count the votes? I, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, uh, nervous about that. But in terms of conferences, debates, conversations, roundtables, I mean, it's going to be greatly, greatly enriched by the participation, by the, the, the format, the platforms. I think also, and uh, Carlos uh, mentioned that, I mean, even though of not course. everybody has access exactly. to... Exactly. Uh, okay. To, we, uh, we must... We must think that you, you Mac, you, you, you know, is more European, but you Mac, you always have to think of the world and the world is not equal. The world has many inequalities and countries have many inequalities. And uh, in other webinars, the issue was raised of people not having access, first of all, to, the, to a good network, a good internet network. Mm. Uh, in the context of students that came up, I think mostly. And also, um, Laptops, basic infrastructure for access, you know, and uh, it can I agree create... with that, but I think the access to physical places um, yeah, is agree. difficult agree. Um, to come to, to particular universities, to have access to museums. It's just something which is not even within reach for many, many people out there. Agree. So agree. whilst I agree that there are challenges to the... To yeah. Um, hardware, software, and and uh, uh, network. Um, yeah. I think in comparison to being able to go to a place, it's and the cost. Imagine negligible. we would go to Australia this year. Imagine the cost for Europeans, for Asians not so expensive, but for and for Africans totally forbidden. You know they could never uh, have access. So there is this problem of um, you know traveling, also the impact of the environment. Exactly. I think there's no. There's no way back. We're going to do much more things online. Regarding museums, I have a different position. I don't think that we can completely switch on. Otherwise, we kind of, uh, you know, deny the reasons for existence ourselves. So I agree. But uh, yeah. if if there is a second wave, or if it's not, yeah. safe, or if people are don't feel safe to travel, um, then we won't have any other uh, opportunities. So I Definitely, think being yeah. flexible there and yeah. being realistic about how people feel about going into an enclosed space, which is what we all are, often in old buildings, often with very limited way to socially distance. Um, I think we won't be given a choice. Yeah. I have to say, from our experience, Steph, just, and then I will mute myself, but um, just to say that the attendance in our museum here in uh, Lisbon has been very, very low. Okay, so we've been open since 18 May, but people are not coming, you know, people are not coming. So it's not that you feel like going to a museum now, you know, apart from all the rest, you know, you're afraid, it's an enclosure. Contrary to the botanic gardens, we have two botanic gardens and people have been going like crazy to the gardens, to the two botanic gardens. So I think you're right, you know, people are not confident they feel, and especially now in Lisbon, we're having a now, not, I wouldn't call a second wave. I have no idea what it means, a second wave or whatever, but we're having a peak in numbers, in cases. And so people are afraid. So they're not visiting museums mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah. No, okay, that's the point. So Yuri, I see, I mean, you, you are commenting in the chat on hi, hi. Uh, on the uh, on on the online um, because I, I'm just wondering almost I'm so I mean so privileged and so used that um, especially when I worked and lived in the Netherlands you know all the infrastructure was so great and I I cannot even think how students could actually how students could actually learn in the 21st century without having access to all those digital resources how how, how does that happen. Can you maybe say a few things about that? Well, I am from a, a city that, that is called Guadalajara. It is in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And when this, uh, this situation began, 
uh, most of the people realize that most of these students have, by example, the computers, the laptops, uh, but by example, they, they doesn't have Wi-Fi at their houses. Mm -hmm. And, yes. and, and that was a huge problem. And most, and, and even in a personal way, it, I was so shocked because I, I was taking for granted that most of the people have Wi-Fi. Yes. And, and even here and the, activi the cultural activities that offer the government, it is just uh, for the people who, who have Wi-Fi. So uh, here in, 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 in this country um, exist this, uh, well, the, not, not, not all the people, not, not all the uh, students have the, the, these privileges, but, yeah. but also um, it is, uh, there is something that, that I, I am thinking like all, all those days, uh, that maybe the it, it is it, it shouldn't be a privilege it shouldn't be like like um, a right uh, it is it, there is something that maybe you 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 need to have and and maybe uh, the university or maybe the the government uh, needs to work uh, to offer in 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 our specific case uh, to offer the possibilities and the tools to, to make this uh, function because mm -hmm. it is not working and, and we're, we're seeing that it is not, it is not, um, yeah, it is not working as they, they it, it has to be. So yeah. it, it, it has been like pretty difficult to, to see that and realize yeah. that. Do we do we have examples, Martin? I don't know that um, if um, about from universities that actually do not have a campus-wide broadband or, or Wi-Fi. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, by example, I I I remember a case that Anna Soler talked about like two weeks ago about the students at the university of the university in Mexico City, the mm -hmm. the UNAM, and. And she said that most of the students, like they, they give up by, by the moment uh, their duties because they didn't have like the, the possibility, possibilities to, to continue. Plus uh, that university have so much students that came from other parts of, of from other different cities. So, mm -hmm. It, it was like hard for them even well in a personal way I, I have a, a friend of mine and and she just came back to to our city and and she like post the their uh, her education for now so mm -hmm. mo, mo, much uh, students uh, these years are are like posing this uh, this possibility Mm -hmm. But we, we hope that uh, next year, as, as we maybe all, all of us, we hope so, so much things uh, uh, that, that the things could, could be better. Uh, as, you, as you say, uh, as everybody said, uh, the things after this are not going to be the same. They have to be better. They have to be more equal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we that have a, to listen. Yeah. That is a good statement. I think, I mean, this is, it's, it's a discussion of our day and age. I think how we can reach more equality or more equity, at least in, uh, in the world. And um, um, yeah, the world is not equal yet. That's very obvious. Um, so Lisette, you're also from Mexico. Do you have, do you recognize all these, um, these uh, observations? Excuse me? Uh, yes, for sure. Oh. Uh, yes, I'm from Mexico too. Uh, I, I live actually in Mexico City. And okay. uh, I work at the Tecnológico de Monterrey, which is a private university. And we, even though we have the privilege of having um, Wi-Fi and having many, um, let's say, um, things that not all people in Mexico City have, uh, let's say the students even, 
even though we, we saw that we have a lot of things that uh, at school we provide the students that they actually don't have. For example, uh, softwares and things they have to use in, at school for, for learning, uh, they pay uh, the school for having them at school and they use the computers at, at school mm. and actually they went back home and they can't learn at all, you know, Some, sometimes because they don't have the software and sometimes they don't have computers to even, um, let's say, um, in general, uh, the Wi-Fi in Mexico is not very good. We have problems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, normally, uh, we have a lot of problems in different cities and we just um, have been, uh, let's say, we have meetings or things and suddenly they stop and they they don't have a Wi-Fi for a weekend, for example, the whole city. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a problem. And obviously, um, we have been noticing too that uh, for um, the, the people that work at the university, uh, even that, that that's a thing that we we didn't uh, assume, no, that if they don't have computers at, at home, everyone, and not mm -hmm. everyone has Wi-Fi too. So it's something that is a reality in Mexico, and we have mm -hmm. been, been talking about uh, how to uh, analyze the, the way of um, working together uh, in order to, I don't know, make a reflection about um, about this, about how uh, make a change into that inequality in Mexico, because actually culture, art, it's not, a, let's say, open for everyone, no? In Mexico, even though it's for free, going to museums and all that, um, not everyone can go. Not everyone have the the possibility to go and and to um, have access to culture. So uh, it's another thing that probably um, change, you no, know, and, and probably having internet uh, for free, let's say, mm -hmm. more than we have it right now, can be a, a, a door that can be open for people to go to culture, you no. Know? But I, I agree with Sayuri and Anna no? mm -hmm. here in Mexico and probably many many countries in Latin America we have this problem. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there anything to add um, in, in that respect from the perspective of your colleagues maybe um, 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 or, or should we move to, to maybe one of the, the other questions that were uh, proposed um, because we're not going to be able to roll out 5G broadband in Mexico this afternoon. So, but um, um, that will come at some point. The, um, um, so one of the questions is, I mean, we're all talking about like, we shouldn't go back to the way we were before. We need to change. We need to be more sustainable. We need to be more blended. We need to be more equal, we need to be, um, so So, do you think that the universities that we work in, that they will make a, a real effort to change, um, you know, or can we as museums in universities uh, um, influence the way uh, museums, uh, the, the way our universities will develop? Do we have any ideas, of, 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 have we any examples already where we see you know, even maybe small scale change taking place for everybody. Silence. So, I mean, it's because, I mean, I thought it was an ambitious question um, uh, to begin with, because I think we're still, you know, in the middle of things. I think and, um, and, and some of you are, are even, you know, still not even in the middle, you're still at the, at yeah. the early stages of things. And, and it's really and hard to think what the future will look like in a normal circumstance, let alone this one. Marta. Yeah, and I think that uh, one of the issues that came up in the morning webinar was that universities themselves are very uncertain about the future. Mm. And so uh, we even more, right? Because they don't know about the impact on foreign students. They don't know the impact. Governments themselves are uncertain, you know, of the money they will have to spend and so on to kind of make everything turn around and the economy and so on. 
So it's it's going to be difficult to uh, see where we will be in one year, you know, in terms of uh, our situation. Probably many of us will close. Many of our university museums will close. Although if we look at the problem historically, I don't know in which webinar I already mentioned this, university museums in general are not very vulnerable when there's a financial crisis. If you look at the moments where there has been more destruction, you know, let me put it a different way. Um, the mu university museums are uh, vulnerable when there is there are lots of money for expansion at the university. Okay, so that's when old buildings, uh, that's when collections uh, get destroyed traditionally, you know, to construct new computer science labs and whatever. And so they become at risk. In, mo in the 1990s, they become very much at risk. In fact, that was the more, you know, the crisis that created the university museum movement, the late 1990s, and then UMAC and Universeum. So it was the expansion of the 1990s. Usually when there's no money, it's not destruction really, it's more closures. So you kind of stay, stay there, we don't have money to pay for your you know, overheads and stuff and whatever, but it, there's not significant impact in terms of long-term, you know. You mean we close the door for now on the collections the and then we open them again once there's money? Yeah, yeah. But in the US it's different because of the, they sell a lot of collections when there's financial crisis, right, John? The university starts selling uh, stuff. We're, we're trying to make sure that doesn't happen. In fact, Steph has been helping us on behalf of UMAC. We have a committee uh, a task force for the protection of university prop, uh, collections. Yeah. And what we find in these times of crisis is that universities will look at, at objects they perceive as valuable in the collection and look to sell it to generate funds to pay for staff or other general university operations. And so there's a clash between the mission of the university museum and the mission of the university at large over the top. So they'll say, our, our mission at the university is to teach students, therefore having collections, yeah. that's an option, let's sell them. So we've had, uh, we have a task force of the associations in the US and UMAC is represented, Steph has been the representative uh, for counsel advice. We, we are publishing for the AAMG, the academic, Association of Academic Museums and Galleries in the US is about to publish a, we call it a toolkit, but a, a selection of ethics policies, articles, and uh, uh, resources to help museum directors defend their collections against yeah. museum uh, university administrators. So we have UMAX documents that will be in the yeah. Uh, in the toolkit, it'll be accessible to anyone, so you'll be able to get it online through the AAMG probably in a month from now. Uh, we've had only two uh, instances of uh, where we're afraid that something might be happening. One very interesting that I have not heard before. In an art school, the art professors wanted to sell the Monet and something else because they wanted to decolonize their college art collection and pay for, for uh, staff to prevent staff cuts. So they well, said, sell the Monet and do this so now as a very small minority of faculty members. And their, their problem is that the faculty doesn't want to take the pay cut that everyone else is taking. I get so it. they want to sell the Monet. But it was very interesting. They were art faculty that wanted to do it. It's a small minority. I don't think this will happen. Uh, so we haven't activated the task force yet, but, the, uh, mm -hmm. but we did talk to the director recently, Jill Dupey, who many of you know yeah. is the co-chair with me. Yeah. Yeah. And we're very vigilant and very concerned because as this gets worse financially and, and, and universities are losing 
tens of millions and in some case hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because of tuition, dormitories, food yeah. sales, all that revenue goes away and private universities are expensive in the US and the more expensive the university, the less uh, robust the enrollment. So a lot of students say, if I can't be on campus, I won't go and uh, I'll wait, I'll defer for a, a half a year or a year, do something else and come back. So, so we're very concerned about that, uh, uh, but, but we're, we think we're going to be able to stop most of this from happening. And, uh, and, but you're right, Marta, the other thing is that the universities otherwise don't get, don't, don't get uh, not knocked out, except if they, if they try to sell the things. That's the real, the real fear. They are getting budget cuts, though, uh, bigger yeah. cuts than the rest of the departments, 20%, 30%, 40%. So the, the, cuts, are, the cuts are bad. Okay, that's that's a good update. I was actually curious when the toolkit would come out. So that was, um, thank you for that update. Maybe you can um, put a link to AMG uh, resources we, 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 on the, in the chat. We that, definitely that want to make this accessible to, a, a, yeah. uh, to, to UMAC yeah. And, yeah. And, and our colleagues. So we'll, yeah. we'll do our best, maybe about a month. We will, uh, yeah. Steph, you'll be, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll convene yeah. them. The, the yeah. So, so one of the interesting questions I think is, is, um, so most of the universities in, uh, uh, most of the museums in universities are usually free to visit, um, or at least very many are maybe not in the U S but, um, um, in, in, in most other places are, I think in South America, if I heard your comments, they, they're usually free. Um, but you can lose a lot of money. Like I think in uh, in Oxford, I mean, you have a number of museums and some of them are heavily relying on on ticket income, are they not, Silke? That is absolutely true. Some of the museums um, charge for exhibitions. We don't, do not, but uh, the large museum, the Ishmolean is. Uh, but where we are losing massively is on donations at the door and in the shops. Um, commercial income is a major source of income for museums in the UK and we, being the smallest of the university museums, have been leading on, um, have to show off a little bit here, have been leading on donations at the door and that of course is all going now. On the other hand, we are rethinking that and we are finding ways to include that in our online offer to encourage people to give online for the changes we are making um, and that is being very successful. So again, uh, it's a matter of rethinking what we're doing. And just to come back to your question a little while ago, Steph, whether there are small changes happening, um, I thoroughly believe that this is an opportunity. Um, we often mm. say university and us, but ultimately we are part of the university. It doesn't always feel like that, but we are the university. Um, and in the current crisis, in the current climate where everybody is unsure, everybody is uncertain, there is not the well-established roadmap that has been trodden for 800 years. That is an opportunity for us to really, um, with creative ideas, make a change. And I think okay. we should have no. Thank you, Elena. How are you? Nothing. Um, so, conclude. Conclude. Uh, sorry, there was a Elena was a yeah, yeah but sorry. she's muted now. No, but I was curious. So, can can you briefly explain how you do that, making money from your online, um, if I can call it that? Well, it's uh, we're basically linking calls for support with the offer we're making. So. Uh, you scroll through, an, through an, an offer, through an event we're doing online or a changed uh, a web offer, uh, whatever it is, um, um, a puzzle online, which people really adore. And, mm -hmm. say, oh, and by the way, um, if you like that, would you like to support us? Um, and um, more and more people are getting into that because everybody is now so much more online um, mm -hmm. than there used to be. So again, mm -hmm. Advantage. It's, it's a matter of thinking differently. We've never done this before. But we really have to rethink. We need the money. Actually. Mm. Okay, that sounds uh, that sounds interesting. I, I, I like to I like to to share some something. Uh, 
our museum is free for students and researchers and teachers too. But recently we, we have an um, um, uh, offer with uh, Samsung because Samsung have a special um, uh, TV that is called frame. It's just like a, a, a building, uh, uh, like a work of art. And mm -hmm. uh, they likes to, to include uh, in his uh, software some works of uh, Colombian artists. And we made this, this uh, conversation and probably uh, it's, it's a good uh, thing to, uh, a lot of museums, uh, museum, university museums have uh, good collections and a special work of art. And probably the, the, the TV, the smart TV and some of uh, uh, wallpapers of uh, cellular phones, probably it's, it's a good uh, thing to, to obtain uh, an agreement with the uh, companies like uh, Samsung, Huawei, or Apple to, to include this and finance some some of them. That sounds that sounds very creative. The um, um, I, w I was just working this week. I'm a member also of the Ethics Committee of ICOM, and the uh, we were working on guidelines for sponsorship for sponsoring um, and and other you know other development. The, uh, how you, how, however you find money from third parties and um, trying to look at the ethics of that because it's becoming more and more difficult because officially it seems we're not allowed to accept any money anymore from tobacco companies, alcohol, pharma, fossil fuels. I know it becomes more and more uh, difficult in many places to um, weapons industry, of course. Um, so um, uh, what is good, but as I think you know, so far, this sounds like a good source. This um, sounds like a plan. The, um, um, so we have about five minutes left. Are there um, any particular stories or, 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 or questions or observations that any of you would like to share or talk about in this last, uh, in this last bit of, the, of this session? Yeah, I would like to share something. <laughs> But just yes, quickly, uh, we are a small museum, so we don't have a lot of visitors and the income that we have is just from the government. Mm -hmm. And we also can sell things from our museum because it's like a public space and we, we cannot sell things. So, but we are may, mainly a research museum. But we are trying to, to get in virtual world to share more knowledge and try to keep uh, in focus, you know, because we are try we, we receive a lot of uh, visitors from schools, university, mm -hmm. and also professors and technicians that go there and learn a, a little bit about, about oceanography. But it's a it's a time very difficult because we we had some uh, projects approved by the laboratories that work it, work in, in the museum, but all the the projects that we have is like without money. The money were were was changed the, for COVID, so we didn't receive the money. And now we may not receive them at all. So it's a, a difficult time to, to keep with the, the project and the, the work yeah. in, in, our, in our museum. I, I think not just there. I think all universities, they've done a couple of things. One is freeze all the hiring of new staff, end all temporary contracts, and also all money that is not essential um, is frozen or, or cancelled. I had the same. I was literally almost pushing the button to buy three very expensive research microscopes and almost when I was doing that, the call came like, okay, so mm -hmm. you can't spend anything anymore. 60,000 pounds, just gone. And it's, um, it happens. Yeah, it's... Um, um, Anybody else for um, a final remark, uh, something uplifting, something happy 
Sí, ok. Uh, well, I don't John. want to share a story, but I would like to put in a plea. Um, I found these webinars hugely, hugely helpful, uh, really good to share with colleagues. Um, I know this is the last one, but can I put in a plea that we meet again, say, in a month or so? A month these days is a hugely long time. As we said earlier, neither of us knows where this is going. So let's meet again um, and just share. Where have we gone? Did it work out the way we were planning? Where are our creative ideas going in the right direction? What can we do to support each other? Okay, two things, Silke. Yes, I've been receiving lots of emails from people, you know, uh, asking to continue. Maybe continue not because Maybe, maybe later we mm. will resume. Um, and not only that, you know, the idea of this thing was very spontaneous, was just to have a place where we could chat, you know, there's no scholarship involved, you know, no submission, peer review, no nothing, you know, it's just to be around, you know, like we have, like what we're doing, you know. And so a lot of people have uh, emailed me and, you know, other some of the other moderators saying how important this was to have this community that came all the time and that they would be looking forward during the week and so on because it's a way to stay connected with the broader international community so uh, we're going to do that we're, we're considering you know to continue um, resume later and you will be receiving through Winja Winja Chu our secretary an evaluation, a, a survey. So you will be able to say how important this was and give us feedback because we are also, you know, totally going from zero to full digital one with YouTube and everything. We have no idea what we're doing, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so we need feedback mm -hmm. from you and uh, from our members in general, and uh, also suggestions of topics that you would like us to address and maybe even guests that we can invite to speak because now you can invite everyone you know because we don't have to <laughs> basically you know and so yeah we're going to do that so survey and more webinars absolutely good good john you had your hand up i i i, I silka beat me to it i really wanted to compliment marta the board steph and others for bringing us together. This is this is like a think tank. These are the expertise that's assembled on my screen here. I I, I can't get at the university, and the chance to 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 forge ties. It's very hard to make friends once a year, once every other year. As much as I look forward to getting together in person, it's quite hard. But every week for for a month to be able to have these conversations to me has been extraordinarily valuable and and i really want to compliment the leadership of of, of umac for making this happen and, and as we are rethinking our museums as we come out of this i think this is our chance to rethink our association and how we how we interact with each other and i think you're in exactly the right direction marta and, and so compliments yeah and one of the things that I've loved most personally, so maybe I, I should close this um, before handing over to Marta, is, um, is um, I've been talking to colleagues from Asia, for it, especially because I was in the morning seminars, more often than the colleagues who live in the next town in Scotland. And it's been really, really amazing that, that I've also had a lot of, you know, separate one-on-one -on -one conversations with a bunch of colleagues, and it's been really, um, fun and interesting. So um, yes, I, I think this was a great idea, Marta. So I can't, I won't take credit, but Marta should. Thank you, and I give hand over to you. Well, I accept all the gratitude on behalf of all the members and on behalf of everyone who has participated uh, in these webinars. And I really look forward to your suggestions on how we can take this forward. And uh, same format, other format, you know, more people, you know, free, free, free in the sense you don't have to register, just anyone comes. Uh, so we're accepting suggestions and we really would like to keep this community, online community that we gradually built, you know, with people from, I don't know, some 30, 40 countries. 
of course, they organize themselves according to the time zone. That's normal. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I feel really feel that there was a, a community. The same we see the same faces every week, and it's been very very gratifying also for me. I've been learning so much from each one of you. So let's uh, close this uh, last last for the moment last for the moment um, webinar. And I, I first thank Steph also very good moderation and um, uh, for writing, for participating, for uh, commenting on the chat. And uh, yeah, and we'll see each other. The next time we see each other will be on the 27th of July on Zoom for um, UMAC members and also on YouTube for everyone else. We will have our annual general meeting. And, and yeah, and the second round of our UMAC uh, webinars. So thank you so much and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hugs. Thank you.